who are big fans of Magna and have listened to this series and happen to be in town and are here, so welcome. And also welcome to our much, much larger virtual audience. Um, everything will be hybrid going forward with our events. So you have a choice of watching our events at the comfort of your own home. And I hope as restrictions lift, we'll be able to welcome larger crowds in person into this beautiful space. As you all know, the first year we opened in March 2019, we had a whirlwind year of 185 events. And then we pivoted like everyone else in March of 2020. And this is our third event in person in 18 months. Um, I so look forward to you listening to Megna and Dori Scheimer, who is a senior producer on On Point. This is, Prime Effect was an eight-part series on On Point, examining the phenomenon of Amazon. This is the ninth, and they're happy to say, final episode. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so very much, Amy, and good evening to everyone here in Boston. This is the first time that I have been back in city space as well uh, in 18 months, so it's actually very great. It feels really good to be back with um, all of you here in the city space uh, uh, event area. And I wanna also say good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of our online um, attendees, wherever you are in the world, watching this event today and particularly good afternoon for those of you who are in Seattle um, because I would have to say that I still seek some silver linings to this pandemic and one of them is that we have vastly expanded our definition and sense of community to be not only those we can see in person but those who uh, are part of our radio community and our online community so we're very very happy to be co-hosting tonight's event with KUOW in Seattle. So um, a round of applause for another great public radio station. As, uh, as Amy said, I'm Meghna Chakrabarty, host of On Point, and this is Dori Scheimer. She's our senior editor and really the intelligence behind our whole Amazon series because she did research for dozens and dozens and dozens <laughs> and dozens and dozens of hours, talked to many, many dozens of people and uh, single-handedly had to wrestle Amazon's very ample media relations <laughs> department for what became an eight-hour on-air series and tonight's uh, event as well, all about one of the most fascinating companies I have ever had a chance to cover and learn about. Um, and we tried to learn all about it, but of course we didn't learn all about Amazon because that is just not possible. <laughs> it is too big. It is huge. It is uh, its tentacles or its reaches everywhere uh, in the United States and, and around the world. So uh, one of the things I learned is that it's actually impossible or at least very difficult to really fathom all of the ways in which this one company is having an impact on our lives. And in a sense, that's exactly why we picked Amazon to do this really deep dive with, because it's emblematic, we think, of a tiny handful of tech companies that are so influential, I would argue they're reshaping society. Uh, and so with that in mind, with Amazon, we wanted to take a look at the good. Uh, and we heard a lot from a lot of people who had a lot to say about what they thought was good about Amazon. We wanted to take a look at the bad and then we wanted to ask, like, how can we as a society who are living with these, th this corporation or these corporations writ large maximize the good while minimizing the bad? And so that's why in tonight's sort of final conversation about Amazon, we want to round out the series with a discussion of our major takeaways about the company with that question mind, in mind, how to maximize the good while minimizing the bad. Because really, as citizens in the society, in which the tech, that the tech companies are changing. That's, answering that question is our responsibility. So what do we wanna do as citizens on, um, once we understand the reach that, uh, that these, these companies have in our lives? So that's what we're gonna try and explore a little bit tonight. Yeah, and we tried in that first episode to answer this question, like what is Amazon? It's a retailer, but it's so many other things in addition to that. So we asked listeners to participate and answer that question for us, playing a little Mad Libs. So here's some, just some of the very many responses we got when we had people finish this phrase, Amazon is. 
This is Meli Anamalai from Nashua in New Hampshire. Amazon is something I do my best to avoid using. This is Betsy Carroll from Knox, Maine. Amazon is the prime example of all that is wrong with the world. Hi, this is Wayne Simmons from Ellsworth, Maine. Amazon is the last resort. Thanks. Hi, this is Andrea Learned in Seattle. Amazon is primed, pun intended, to step into global transportation emissions reduction leadership by prioritizing e-cargo bikes and cycle logistics for urban last mile delivery. Thanks. Aloha, this is Richard Schnecker from Wahiawa, Hawaii. Finishing a sentence of the day, Amazon is a monopoly. Aloha. Aloha to our listeners in Hawaii. So we want you to participate with that same phrase tonight. So using slido.com, hashtag on point, you can go there now and fill in the blank. Amazon is, and we will check out some of your responses later on tonight. We want lots of audience participation from yeah. everyone here <laughs> and everyone watching online. And by the way, I just noticed, apparently Dory and I have been working so closely on this project for the past many months that we started They're dressing matching. very similarly. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> with blazers and dark <laughs> jeans and brown shoes. Um, but that is that is how the partnership works here. Okay, but by the way, at that same Slido hashtag on point, definitely over the course of the conversation, put in your questions wherever you are, because we'll be monitoring that and we want to incorporate your questions over the course of the conversation. Now, as I said, we talked to dozens of people in, pre pre in preparation for this series. Two of them in particular um, were just extraordinary and we want to have them as part of our conversation tonight. So they are Tim Bray and Joshua McNichols. And Tim is principal consultant at Textuality Services now. He was a senior principal technologist and then vice president and distinguished engineer at Amazon Web Services, so AWS, from December 2014 to May of 2020. And he joins us now from uh, tonight from Vancouver, Canada. So Tim, hello. This is the first time I've actually seen you. Welcome back. <laughs> If he can hear us, okay. We'll make sure he can uh, he can hear us here in a second. So Tim, when if and when you hear us, just wave your hand, and I'll give you a proper hello. Uh, our other guest tonight is Joshua McNichols. He's a reporter and host of the podcast Primed, which is all about K, uh, Amazon. He works at KUOW, and is, he's in Seattle. And Joshua, it is great to see you too. Can you hear me? Oh, I think we're dealing with something of a delay. Hi there, happy to be here. Okay. <laughs> I do think we have a delay. Okay, we're gonna try and figure that one out here. So, so first of all, um, with tonight, we wanted to loosely organize it into the three major uh, takeaways that we, we learned about over the course of this series. And the first one we didn't actually get to. Yes, I can hear you. There is a slight delay here series, for some reason. Which is what does Seattle, the yeah. city of Seattle, but, um, have to teach us uh, about Amazon's potential impact everywhere? Uh, Seattle being both the prove, you know, the proving ground and home of Amazon's first headquarters. So if we can see if we can get Joshua back, we're going to try to start with him since he reports uh, on Amazon from Seattle. Are we good to try getting Joshua back? Okay, well, while we wait for that, oh wait, Joshua, can you, can you hear me now? Can you hear and see us? <laughs> okay, um, what I'm gonna do to, uh, to uh, give us a little taste of the, kinds of the kind of reporting that Joshua- Yes, I'm here, there's a huge delay. It's like 10 seconds long, maybe 15, so. Yeah, because we're watching delay. you on the YouTube stream and uh, don't have your audio on Skype. I see. Mm. OK, uh, we will still try to figure that out. But I'm wondering if we can actually play a little bit of some of Joshua's reporting, because we talked to him about the fact that Seattle is oftentimes a place where, excuse me, where Amazon might try, um, might launch a new idea. 
you know, test phase, essentially. And one of the things they have done is they're, you know, they bought Whole Foods a while ago, um, and now they're trying to see if they need to move more forcefully into brick and mortar grocery stores. And uh, Joshua did some excellent reporting on that. And he went to a new Amazon Fresh store in a Seattle neighborhood uh, called Central District. And we want to listen to how that went. And he shopped with a, a native Seattleite named Victoria. So let's listen to a little bit of Victoria in the Amazon Fresh store. Alexa, where do you find catfish? I am not sure where to find catfish. Please check with the store associate for help. Hey Alexa, where do you find sweet potatoes? I am not sure where to find sweet potatoes. Please check with the store associate for help. Hey Alexa, where do you find wine? You can find wine at R5. What does that tell you? It tells me that she's not black. <laughs> hey Alexa, where do I find black eyed peas? Find black eyed peas at R1. Okay. Well, maybe she's half black. <laughs> I always felt that Victoria was so generous with Alexa in that moment. So we're going to try again with Joshua, and hopefully we've got some he, a shorter delay, if none at all, ideally. <laughs> I guess we still have a delay. Okay, so Dory, Joshua. you actually talked to Joshua a lot this is know, in preparation for that yeah. particular episode. Can you... Tell us a little bit what, about what he shared with yeah, you. Yeah, and I think Seattle came up even from the first episode as we kind of learned about the dynamic between Amazon and Microsoft that we saw in each of our you know, parts of Amazon. There was this competition there. Amazon tried to learn from Microsoft, and you know, it's one of the reasons that they were there across, across the street, <laughs> if you will. And talking to Joshua, um, he said that there's a real divide in Seattle between people like Victoria Beach who are skeptical of Amazon's reach in her city. Her neighborhood is gentrifying, and this Amazon Fresh store is just the latest kind of physical example and representation of what she feels is kind of losing her, her neighborhood now to Amazon. Right, and Joshua told us and told you that what was interesting is Amazon goes in, and obviously you heard in that piece of tape that they stocked the store early on with things that weren't necessarily entirely what the neighborhood who had been shopping there wanted in their grocery store. So the company came in with a different perception than the actual customers it was supposed to serve, which is really odd because another one of our major takeaways is this is a famously customer-focused company. So yeah, but what do we Joshua know also yeah. talked to you know several residents who this Amazon Fresh store is kind of in the retail space of this new high-rise apartment building. So while Amazon may have been catering to the people who lived in that specific building or in the buildings around it, they were blind to what this neighborhood had historically been and what you know the people who had lived there for decades were still trying to hold on to. And Amazon, you know, uses technology there. A lot, they have Alexas and grocery stores to tell you exactly where things are. But this isn't the only example where they missed the mark just a bit on, on the human mm -hmm. component of, of applying that technology. But then continued to adjust, though. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Joshua talked to a manager who said, yeah, we, we learned pretty quickly that there were some items that, that um, customers were coming in for I can hear you just a little bit now. If you... We changed the inventory and adjusted that pretty fast. Mm. How are we doing on seeing if we can get them up with at least with sound at the moment? Yeah, I could hear you now. Can you hear me? Still working on it? Still working on it. Okay. I can hear. Uh, well, so the These other are some of the fun technical difficulties we, <laughs> we work with every day. On our live show frequently. Yeah. If you wonder if you wonder at all how I get through the portions where we can't hear our guests, it's because people like Dory are telling me what to say. Um, <laughs> no, but actually, so the other thing that I found rather in, really interesting uh, about this story that Joshua brought us is two things. One is Amazon is trying to really integrate technology into every part of its business, AKA also every part of our lives. So there's a scene that Joshua had in his reporting where Victoria was trying to check out her items that she bought from this Amazon Fresh store. And you're supposed to just scan it, right? Or just 
It's not even a scanner. The, yeah, no, the cart detects the items that yeah. are in your cart, and that's how you check out. Right, but it didn't detect anything in her cart. Yeah. So, the, <laughs> so the employees were like, I guess you can just have it for free for today. Um, but, you know, I guess they're okay with publicly debugging their, their high-tech grocery stores. But on the flip side of all this, there was a lot of, there was a sense from some of the employees that Joshua talked to, and we will get him eventually, and he will tell you in much more detail than I can, but Dory, share this part with us, where um, because they were working for Amazon, right, they weren't working for an, a, a business that only does groceries, some of the employees actually felt that they had way more career paths or possible uh, paths to growth than they would have otherwise, say, if they were working only for Whole Foods or only for a stop and shop or only for a, I guess, a Fred Meyer or something. Yeah, and, and that's a really interesting piece of it because Amazon is having to adjust to be more competitive in this labor market right now. Andy Jassy, the new CEO, seems to be really aware that the public perception of Amazon, an employer, needs to be improved. And Joshua's reporting reflects that they, they are making some strides in telling um, new employees at this Amazon Fresh store that there is career advancement to stay with Amazon, which is uniquely different than what we heard from warehouse workers mm -hmm. who said, yeah, they would train us, but they would tell us to take that training and go elsewhere, that there wasn't that room for advancement within Amazon. Right, that in fact it's a completely different company. Yes. It, if you're away from the corporate side, and I would say that the Amazon Fresh stores are still fairly close to the corporate side because it's not a fully established mm -hmm. business that they've let out into the world. If you're away from the corporate side, it's a completely different company. That's what we heard a lot from current and past employees. Yeah, including Tim Bray. I mean, who, who described it as, you know, the best job he ever had and an amazing place to work, which was different than yeah. warehouse employees. Checking in. Doesn't look like we got it yet. Okay. Um, well... What I'd like to do is play a little bit more, if possible, from some of the reporting that Joshua gave us, um, because not only is that Amazon Fresh store an example of how Seattle has had to absorb um, Amazon as its biggest business because of the headquarters being there, but of course there's the ancillary impact, both negative and positive, and he has actually done reporting on how People, some people in Seattle think that it's quite good to have Amazon as uh, the biggest presence in the city. Um, for example, regarding with some businesses that surround Amazon's main campus in Seattle. And here's what uh, one business person told Joshua. I know Amazon can be a, a controversial topic for, for folks. Our experience with them as a landlord, you know, as a tenant of theirs has been really positive. So do you remember why he told Joshua that it was a positive experience? Yeah, so that was Jeremy Price. He owns um, Wilmot's Ghost. It's an Italian restaurant and the base of Amazon's fears. So Amazon has done a lot through the pandemic as a landlord. They own the property around their campus, and there's a lot of businesses and restaurants. Um, and they use that to attract talent to work at Amazon headquarters. So they have not asked for rent from those businesses around their campus in a year and a half um, because they see that as an investment in keeping their workforce that they didn't want when they returned to the office when they had people come back in the office to see this deserted neighborhood um, that they wanted it to still be vibrant for their workers so it was in their best interest to you know swallow that <laughs> that lost rent for a year and a half to maintain this kind of cultural neighborhood that they had allowed to sprout. Right. Now, I just want to Looks acknowledge like I'm here. Can you hear everyone me now? here and everyone watching online, no. let us admit the truth. It's super bizarre for two people sitting in Boston to talk about what's happening <laughs> in Seattle. Uh, and it's incredibly complicated, the story of Amazon in Seattle. So we're going to, we're working on the fly here. For those of you who are watching, especially from Seattle, if you have access to Twitter, because our Slido's on pause here for a second while we deal with the technical challenges of getting Josh um, and Tim back on, and I want to let the team do that, but hop on Twitter, and my Twitter handle is Megna WBUR, which is M-E-G-H-N-A-W-B-U-R, and um, shoot me a tweet if you're watching this from Seattle, and let us know, like, what you think the reality of having having Amazon headquarters in Seattle is because 
when we get Josh back, I will ask, we'll ask him about things about jobs, about housing, about gentrification, about the cost of living, uh, about what it's like politically to have a trillion dollar corporation uh, owning your backyard, for lack of a, <laughs> yeah. of a better phrase. But um, Joy, I'll let you just pick up here with some of the other things we learned about Amazon and Seattle while I get on my Twitter. Yeah, I mean, I think going back to that kind of split among residents in Seattle, there's of course people uh, Amazon is an enormous employer that attracts talent to Seattle that has increased. If you were fortunate enough to be a property owner before Amazon moved in, you have benefited immensely from, from those rising property costs. Of course, that has created uh, an affordable housing crisis for those who haven't, but that kind of ex uh, illustrates that split that people feel. Yeah, and I mean, here in the Boston area, we came close to potentially experiencing that because you'll all remember Amazon's sort of um, Hunger Games death match <laughs> for HQ2, um, as they called it, and Boston actually put forth a um, an interesting proposal because we here in Boston were attracted by the potential. Amazon was saying they were going to bring 50,000 yes, jobs. Yes, can you hear me? But where are you going to put all these new people? Like, What part of the city were we going to develop here? Did we want to... Um, uh, inherit some of the challenges that Seattle did. But of course, everyone here remembers how that went, right? Uh, ultimately, it went to uh, Virginia, Virginia and New York. Oh, no, no, first New York, then Virginia, because yeah, New York New said York, no, yeah. right, so. Rescinded. But in a sense, a lot of people also thought that Virginia was kind of in the, was gonna get it anyway, because Amazon wants to be close to Washington, Washington DC. Okay. So Megna, I think I'm here. I don't know if you can hear me now. Is that you, Josh? <laughs> It's me. Oh, that is fantastic. Wonderful. Hopefully we'll get my like bizarre face off the screen. Oh. <laughs> this is how we look at each other every <laughs> day. Actually, that's true. That's literally how Dory and I stare at each other. But Josh, can you still hear me? I can still hear you. Okay. And Tim, can you hear me also? Okay, we're going to get Tim. Well, this is great. I mean, this is we're radio people, so just having Josh's voice for me is okay. But I'm sorry for everyone watching that we can't actually see him. But we have been trying to sound smart, Josh, about how Amazon is having an impact on the city of Seattle. So set us straight here. I mean, that's a huge question. Where would you begin to answer that question, Josh? Well, you know, like many places, there's delivery vans everywhere and there's warehouses all over the place. But here, we also have experimental grocery stores that kind of come in many different flavors and pop-up stores, the Amazon four-star store and all kinds of different things where Amazon works out some of its new technologies. And then we've got the corporate he headquarters that employs so many people that like if you go to a soccer game, one of my bosses told me the story about his soccer team. Like um, any group of parents that you're talking with, there's gonna be one person there who works for Amazon or, or who has a sibling who works for Amazon or something. So um, I, I feel like uh, Amazon, one of the local columnists here described Amazon's effect on Seattle as that of a prosperity bomb, you know? Oh. And on the one hand, like that's, that's great. It's a lot of money, um, but the money isn't necessarily shared equally. There's a sort of, you can imagine if you just drop a big bag of money on a crowd of people, it's it's not necessarily going to bring out the best of humanity, and so yeah. <laughs> you know we've we've got um, uh, because we have a shortage of housing. You know, there's really competition, really high competition for land, and not everybody can afford to live here. Teachers and firefighters can't afford to live here, yeah. and um, have to move out of the city, have to live south of the city, and um, so there's there's a sort of even though we have this problem in many American cities right now where there's sort of two different classes, um, in Seattle, it's really strong because Amazon is a big fish in this pond. And those problems associated with a tech sector having the wealth in this economy and a non-tech sector maybe lacking access in the same way, um, it's really s strongly felt here. Okay. Well, first of all, it's great. I can actually, we can see you now. And <laughs> it's just great to see you, Josh. And Good to I'm, see you. Ev everyone, I mean, I just want to give our City Space folks a hand because yeah. this is on the fly um, uh, debugging, which is always a very... Uh, 
uh, heartbeat or heart rate inducing <laughs> task. But also Seattle is coming through on Twitter. I love you guys because Josh, <laughs> while we were waiting to get you back up, I, I just opened up my Twitter to, to folks um, in Seattle and said like, what do, how do they think Amazon has been transforming Seattle? And we have uh, Irish Love saying Amazon is ready to walk out of Seattle and is going to the east side of Seattle uh, due to taxes and politics. Uh, Mark says Amazon has been turning Seattle into a transient corporate village using the city's infrastructure and resources, but not paying back. Can you talk about that a little, Josh? Yeah, I mean, Amazon's kind of famous here for fighting against corporate taxation. And so, you know, they like to talk about the jobs and the wealth that they bring here. And they've been trying to soften their image in recent years by, you know, giving by charitable gifts to fight you know, climate change or to reduce homelessness or, or build housing. And those have been significant. But, um, you know, that that came after many years of criticism for not doing enough to mitigate their their bad effects. Um, you know, they they don't like to come out swinging publicly against corporate taxation, but they, you know, they fund the organizations that do. So um, there is a sense that, you know, Many, many people sort of have this idea that Amazon thinks highly of itself, but doesn't necessarily want to pay for the things that help distribute the wealth around or reduce some of the problems that come with that wealth. Mm. Uh, did you have a question for, for Joshua about anything that he talked to you about? Yeah, Joshua, we talked about Victoria Beach, um, and we just played that one clip of her, but you talked to her for much longer. And I, I just would love for you to shed some more light on how Victoria feels about this kind of new physical Amazon presence in her neighborhood. Yeah, well, the thing that really interested me in talking to her is that, um, you know, we're here in Seattle, we're very familiar with the effects of Amazon's growth in a neighborhood we call the South Lake Union neighborhood, which used to have a lot of warehouses, had some affordable housing, but you know, that's kind of where Amazon's um, explosive growth was centered for a long time. Um, but as you know, a, the grocery store expansion is sort of a new way in which we can try to measure how people perceive Amazon in different neighborhoods that it's sort of colonizing in a way. Um, that's probably the wrong word to use. That's not really fair. But um, um, and so this neighborhood is a neighborhood where um, for years, there's been a lot of, you know, historically, this was a mostly black neighborhood. And as the city has gotten more expensive, you know, some residents have cashed out and made a good deal. Um, but others have, you know, been forced out as rents have increased. And, um, you know, many of those black neighborhoods have moved away. Victoria Beach describes herself as the last black household on her block. So when Amazon, which kind of blew up in the South Lake Union neighborhood, um, comes in with a, um, with a presence in this neighborhood, um, it, I was curious how it would be perceived and, and whether the company's efforts to be seen more as a, as a benefit would be would be something that was embraced by residents who had historically been feeling pressured and pushed out here. And I, I think Victoria, in, maybe even in ways that you didn't see in that clip, um, walks that line. Because not only was Victoria sort of looking for foods that she was comfortable with in the store, she also applied for a job at that Amazon Fresh. She's 62 years old, but she thought, you know, I, I could work here and maybe this would be a good opportunity for me. I need a little bit of extra cash. Um, but she decided not to. She pulled out after applying for the job and getting it because of what her friends would think. And um, what they, th what she said is that she was afraid she would be perceived as a traitor. And I think it's because of some of those complexities where, you know, it's kind of, um, I think if you're in, in any conversation you're a part of in Seattle about Amazon, you have to be able to be empathetic also to the, so many people that we know have not won the prosperity game that Amazon presents, you know? Um, and, and you can't just parrot the talking points about innovation and bias for action and things like that and, and seem um, like you're getting the full picture, so. Yeah. 
Well, speaking of the full picture now, is that <laughs> is that Tim Bray that we can actually see and hopefully hear? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, Tim. Can you can you hear me? I can. Okay, good. Just a slight delay there. Yeah. That's a manageable <laughs> delay. It's good to this. see you, Tim. Uh, thank you for bearing with us as we had to debug all of that, but it's great to have you. Uh, that's Tim Bray again. He uh, used to be a senior executive at Amazon Web Services, uh, and I, I have a lot to talk with you in a couple of minutes, Tim, about whether or not Amazon is a monopoly. So hang on here for <laughs> just a second. But we did do that poll. Can we, can we show the results of the first poll about what um, everyone watching thinks Amazon is? <laughs> I'm really making our team work hard today. <laughs> and we did tell her during prep to ignore you. That's right. This. And see, I'm just changing the rules on them as well uh, at the same time. So I'm very sorry, Candace. <laughs> So everything from essential to my personal life to unraveling the fabric of our communities. Union busting, also good and bad. So before we move on, Dory, this is something that we saw over and over and over again in all eight episodes about the complexity of people's feelings about this company. Yeah, and we had a listener in our last episode who kind of verbalized this <laughs> in, in such a strong way that she has relied on Amazon more than ever in the pandemic to get her the basic things that she needed and feel so guilty every time she clicks buy. And we heard that over and over again, uh, whether people used Amazon or not feeling these, these complex feelings about a company that is just so present in our lives, this feeling that it's unavoidable, but I want to avoid it. Um, to, to people just saying, this has made my life easier. Mm -hmm. And I think Amazon is recognizing that kind of chasm more than ever. Yeah, and, and so the reason why I found this personally really fascinating is that, you know, feelings might be feelings, but again, regarding that question of like, what do we as citizens want to do about these giant um, corporations, actually how we feel about their impacts on our lives is a very big driver to um, uh, when it comes to deciding about policies we'd either support or not support. So we're gonna get to that in the third part of tonight's conversation, but we have another poll. Yeah, we have another question for you. So before we get to this next part of tonight's conversation, we wanna know about your Amazon habits. So for our audience tonight, we want you to go back to slido.com, hashtag on point, and tell us how often you think you use Amazon. And there's a couple choices for you, and we'll get back to see how often they do. <laughs> a few minutes. Yeah, how often do you think you use Amazon? It's our next question for all of you here and online. Um, and again, slido.com on point, is, or hashtag on point is where you can send your questions to and they are coming in. So we'll get some of these uh, incorporated here in just a second. But so we talked a little bit about Seattle with some uh, bumps in the road there. Uh, but our next big takeaway was how strong Amazon's corporate culture is like I, I describe it as like superhero strong, but maybe not in like the superhero positive save the world kind of way, uh, because even its massive PR department through and through every way they interacted with you, Dory, mostly reflected this corporate culture. And so the reason why I think citizens need to understand that is that once you do and you get a better handle about what the corporate culture is, you will understand that everything Amazon says publicly and does everything you read from them is filtered through that culture. So it's really important to understand it. And Dory interacted with Amazon PR for like, what, six straight months? Six months. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we, and, but we successfully got several of the company's vice presidents uh, to join us. And I wanted Dory to pull back the curtain a little bit about what that was like standing there before the Goliath that is Amazon's media relations department. Yeah, I think often when we are doing a show and we have a question for a corporation, for um, a member of Congress, we reach out with that question and often they send us an email back and say, here's the answer or no, we don't wanna give you an answer and we go from there. Um, but with Amazon PR, no matter what the scope of the question was, um, I would get on conference calls and often I would get on these calls to ask them my question and there would be a dozen 
people from their PR team on that call. And I think, well, first of all, I sweat through those calls in full transparency, um, but they are so disciplined. Um, and they are very siloed. They have what's called pizza team. So as Amazon grew, they wanted to maintain this culture that every team was small enough to share a pizza to solve a problem. And they, they really have maintained that. And through their PR, it's the same way. So when we talked to AWS, that those people were completely separate from the people we talked to about Amazon's relationship with small sellers in the marketplace. But the consistency of the language in which they talked to me was was remarkable. The consistency, the discipline, the narrowness of focus with these teams, it was absolutely incredible. And and just to give you a sense of how different that is from other companies and organizations that we have to reach out through their media relations department, it's night and day. Like sometimes, as Doria said, like we might get an email back and then there's a little back and forth and the person gets on, comes on the show, and then we might get like a really long email of all the things they claimed that we said wrong, which usually we do not. But like it's all post play. But Amazon was very, very active even before they would agree to have someone on. And Tim, if you can hear me, um, first of all, I'm just really delighted to see you. But as the man that's worked in Amazon at a senior level, um, when you were there, I mean, how would you describe what the this is another big question, but how would you describe what the company's, the corporate culture uh, was like? Well, it's the best job I ever had. And one of the uh, things that made it that way was that um, it was exceptionally well managed, much more well managed than really anywhere else I'd ever worked in places where I was the, the CEO. And um, that is in large part due to the culture. And there's a huge amount of work that goes into consciously constructing that culture. It doesn't happen by accident. So there's the famous Amazon leadership principles, which are you know, easy to laugh at, but uh, turn out to be pretty widely used and reasonably um, And in particular, they are very intense. Amazon is hiring and promoting people. And so Tim, I'm going to interrupt. I'm so sorry to do this, because we've got you. There's no delay now, but the, the sort of level is going up and down. So we're losing every few words. <laughs> So, so there's an echo. Let me turn off my mic. Uh, well, I'm going to turn off the sound so I can speak like this. OK. So what I was saying is that Amazon is a terrific place to work. And that was partly because of the culture. It's the best managed place I ever worked, including the places where I was the CEO. Um, and part of that is due to the application of the Amazon leadership principles, which sound kind of lame and um, like, like platitudes. but actually turned out to work reasonably well in practice. And uh, one of the places where they're more, more, most intensely applied is in hiring and promotion. So there's a conscious, conscious, explicit effort to hire and promote you know, people who exhibit what are considered to be the desirable parts of, of, of Amazon culture. Um, and you know, one of the core uh, attributes they like there is attention to detail. You know, understanding the problem you're trying to solve in great detail and not getting away with arm waving and statement of platitudes, but getting down to the very precise facts of the matter. So I, I suspect that may work better in running a cloud computing division than it does in running a PR division <laughs> based on, on, your, on, on your experience. Um, but yeah, the, the culture is a very real thing and, and it really works. If you, if you can hear me now. Um... So, but that's the corporate culture for corporate employees, right? Uh, d does that same um, s culture apply to the thousands of people who work at Amazon away from Seattle headquarters? In you know, I mean, the 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 fulfillment center workers, for example, are the primary example, right? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I've never been in one of those, so so I'm not authoritative. But given you know, the, the rate at which they hire and the rate of attrition and turnover, it's hard to believe that you can you know, consciously build the, that kind of uh, conscious culture engineering because it's a very time consuming process. And you know, when the average tenure of somebody is measured in months, you know, is, is that going to actually happen? Um, Joshua, I'm wondering, I'm just taking your question, Dory. I'm just going to steal Go it. Go for it. Uh, uh, in terms of dealing with Amazon um, 
media relations have you had similar experiences as what as what we were describing yeah totally i mean amazonians constantly pepper their speech with references to innovation for example or they'll slip in the phrase day one um, this is kind of a dog whistle that tells people that you don't take anything for granted but you treat every day like it's the first day of amazon's existence when it was still scrappy um, almost all of Amazon's leaders do this multiple times in the same interview, but I've also noticed that ambitious lower level employees do it too, like even grocery store employees. Um, it, there's also some trickle down with how people at Amazon talk about unions. You know, Amazon fights unions. Its leaders like to emphasize, you know, not the fight against unions, but rather how the company rewards innovations and results. Um, and I hear that kind of talk a lot at the top of Amazon. But um, when Amazon connected me with grocery store employees, I also heard this there, that unions hold people back, imposing rules about seniority and stuff that stifle innovation. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, Joshua, I'm sure you've heard the phrase delight the customer a few times um, in talking yes. to, to Amazon, <laughs> Amazonians. Yeah. And what I, th what I thought was so interesting about the questions that we were asking is oftentimes we were asking Amazon to define who the customer was. I mean, when we were talking about AWS, um, when we were talking about Marketplace, for instance, you know, are you trying to delight the customer? Is that the seller on Marketplace or is that... <laughs> the consumer um and yeah. so you see these kinds of um uh dodging honestly when when you have to get down to those kinds of specifics oftentimes we also had a very strange experience which i don't think i've ever actually had where we spoke with um a, a senior executive at, at amazon and again this goes to the discipline um of the company that we didn't give them our questions in advance. We would never do that, right? But so when I was talking with her, uh, I, I would ask my question. No, him. him. That's right. Actually, AWS. it's the current head of AWS, uh, well, a senior level person at AWS. When I was talking with him, um, there would be this like tiny delay and we would hear pages being flipped. And it wasn't him flipping the pages. It was definitely a media relations person there, like flipping the pages for him to find the right answer for him to basically read uh, off the page. Now, everybody has talking points, right, when they speak to the media. That's not unusual. But having it all written out in a notebook and you can hear the pages turning was a first for us. Um, and and but the what what really opened my eyes about it is that this particular senior executive was a very dynamic man mm -hmm. he had lived an amazing life and once they like let him off the leash so to speak he had very interesting things to say about the company but this is not a company that's going to take that risk to begin with um but i should say that you heard tim say this was the best job you've ever had and yet you left this yeah. job why well, that's a matter of public record. You can uh, just type Tim Bray Amazon into, into Google and you'll get all the, the gory details. Uh, I, I left Amazon because uh, during the early days of COVID, there was a big dispute about whether Amazon was taking good enough care of the uh, warehouse workers. And there were two sides to the dispute because, you know, Amazon was putting a lot of work into it, but, you know, the warehouse workers were still acting scared and protesting. And then there were some uh, white collar office workers who were organizing activism on, you know, to expose the concerns of the warehouse workers. And and Amazon reacted to this by firing all of them. And I couldn't really be comfortable with that, so I left. But that's a long time ago. That's old news. What you're talking about is much more interesting. <laughs> it's old. It may not be old news to it may not be old news to everyone, Tim. But it, I just still I want could you just walk us a little bit more through that decision? Why was it that particular thing that you were you were in a high level job at AWS, which is a hugely important part of the company? Um, but you, you left you let it all go because of treatment of employees. Well, what was it about that that made you uh, make that decision? Oh, well, I was carrying a VP rank. And I think that, you know, in, in the world of business, once you've gotten to a VP rank, you really have to be part of the leadership team. And it's just not okay to, to step out and go rogue and start, you know, uh, engaging in external company facing activism and so i was you know i was i was very unhappy with with what the company had done in that situation and since i didn't feel free to speak up about it i thought my only alternative was to leave so i left 
But do, so do you think, though, that, that was also reflective, not your decision, but how Amazon handled that was also reflective of its corporate culture about it does not, you know, they have that famous leadership principle of disagree but commit, but those who disagree, do they suffer sanction at Amazon? No, in general, they don't. It, it, it is absolutely okay to have a vigorous, lively internal debate. But, you know, one of the reasons I left was that I, I kind of liked uh, many aspects of, of the Amazon culture. And um, I really just liked that decision. It seemed to me egregiously stupid. Have, have, have these people never heard of the Streisand effect? You know, it seems like they were painting letters of fire 500 feet high in the sky saying, we don't want you to look at this. Um, and uh, not only was it, you know, I felt fairly brutal and, 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 and amoral, it, it was also stupid. So, so I think that represents actually a major failure of Amazon culture and, and just not something I could, I could live with peacefully. Well, um, <laughs> the, so one, another takeaway regarding the strength of Amazon culture that I think it's important for people to understand um, is that in uh, one of our episodes, we talked about the fact that Amazon is also becoming kind of um, a, uh, a, a breeding ground isn't the right word, but uh, a little factory for future executives, right? So they, lots of people absorb Amazon's corporate culture and then go off to uh, uh, managerial and executive positions in other companies. And we heard quite a bit about that. Yeah, then, yeah, we did. Um, I, I mean, I think that's a, uh, one of the key why it matters questions when we look at Amazon, the employer. They are raising the next generation of corporate leadership, and we're already seeing that happen. Um, we had an, a former Amazon executive who talked about you know, uh, his kind of club of people he came up with at Amazon who are now leading many major companies we're all, all familiar with. So the Amazon style of management, while they say, we just want to take the, the best stuff with us, um, it is really influential in, in the broader labor market and, and for corporations all right. over, across the country. And in this case, we've been talking a lot about corporate culture and not talking at all about actual business practice. Right, which is a, a different and huge thing too, which, you know, success does breed imitators. So how Amazon does business, you may see um, in, in other businesses, perhaps closer to your actual direct life. But again, listen to our series and <laughs> you'll hear a lot about that. But George, do you want to see what our poll revealed? Yeah, and I want to say, I just saw in Slido, someone ask why we didn't have a zero option, which is pure human error on my part, <laughs> so that is why. <laughs> so I appreciate all of you who don't use Amazon at all. Um, and that's, that's the really uncomplicated answer to that. <laughs> but let's see what the, the poll results, for those of you who do use Amazon, how often you're doing so. In the meantime, we, we got this question about what happens if all the Bed Bath & Beyond stores close? So, you know, uh, an alternative, a brick and mortar alternative for many of the items that people use um, for Amazon. And I think when in our last episode talking to Brad Stone, we are seeing um, consumer habits changing while there was a lot of dependence on e-commerce in the pandemic. Now people do want to be able to go to the store. So that's kind of an open question, I think, of what will happen with brick and mortar in that kind of yeah, format. Absolutely. Okay, so here are our results. How often do you think? Now, see, this, this is why we put an asterisk around think. You use Amazon <laughs> one to five times a week, that vast majority of respondents. Okay. Uh, so, Josh, actually, let me ask you, how many times do you think you use Amazon per week? Oh, I use it so often. Um, uh, you know, it's like, we explored this a little bit in Primed how, like, you know, as companies merge, you know, there becomes less incentive to support the little place where you would buy this or that. There are more and more things that are just, you know, um, I, I, we used to have this regional department store called Fred Meyer. It's now part of, you know, the Kroger empire. There's, I don't see a huge sort of local benefit to buying my, um, you know, my socks through Fred Meyer anymore. You know, I just get them through Amazon now. Um, 
but it's you know the world of, world of grocery stores is still very hyper local in a lot of places. We've got local grocery stores um, that we can support, and I'm so the world has not totally changed there yet. There are a lot of things where you can still support mom and pop shops, but um, you know it's been interesting to see how main streets have continued to evolve. Um, through even the pandemic in ways that seek to distinguish what they can do from what Amazon can do. You know, even where there is no Amazon present on some of these little neighborhood business districts, you can see the effect of Amazon in how these little shops are selling the experience of coming in and, you know, um, posting something on their Instagram wall that proves that you were there, you know? Yeah. Well, Tim Bray, can I ask you, what do you think is actually the most accurate answer to this poll about how many <laughs> times people use Amazon per week? And Tim, I hope we didn't just lose you. Are you still there? Yeah. Sorry, say that again, please. What do you, what do you think is the most accurate answer to this poll <laughs> question that we asked about how many times people use Amazon per week? I think um, the interesting thing is I bet that number is coming down. Um, I, I think that uh, Amazon has gotten such a, a bad buzz that there are a few people out there who absolutely do not, you know, consciously are trying to avoid it. So, so, so I think that is coming down. I, I've been doing a little bit of that myself, and I've discovered that for a whole lot of things, you know, there's there's lots of other good places to buy stuff online. People have been watching Amazon's success and, and trying to emulate it with some degree of uh, with, with, with some degree of success. Um, when, you know, when I'm buying a, an electronics commodity like a TV or uh, you know, uh, uh, a Bluetooth adapter, or, you know, I mean, uh, sorry, a Thunderbolt adapter or something like that. I don't want to go and look at it. I just want to go online and, and get it. And, and, you know, I recently bought a TV and I got it from Costco instead. Um, and, 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 you know, I bought some jeans and I went and got them from, from uh, Levi's directly. And, and so, so, you know, I think that's becoming an increasingly viable thing to do and something we're going to see more and more of. Okay, so this is blowing my mind. I want to be perfectly honest because I personally think the answer is more than 15 times per week for almost everybody. Because yeah. we didn't say how many times a week do you use Amazon Marketplace, right? <laughs> we said how many times a week do you think you use Amazon, right? And so if you watch Netflix, you are using Amazon. I don't know if anybody Zooms in here. Also on yeah. AWS. Also on AWS. And if you even from some of the local stores that you're buying online from, it may be getting fulfilled by Amazon. So this was another huge takeaway from, for me that like it, may, it makes total sense that we think first and foremost of Amazon as the retailer, right? Because it is the world's largest retailer. But its presence in our lives, its even bigger presence in our lives is largely invisible. Like if AWS wasn't there, it's not the only, obviously, I'm talking about Tim Bray's former job, but it's not the only um, player in the cloud computing services, but it's a huge one. And we don't even think about it every day. So, so Tim, can you just focusing on AWS for an, another minute here, how, how influential or important do you think AWS is to Amazon as a company and how much presence it actually does have? in people's lives? Well, it has a huge presence in people's lives. Um, you know, the world of, of IT, information technology, as we say, is huge. You know, three or four trillion dollars a year. And all the cloud companies together are only maybe 100 billion or 200 billion. So, so it's not as though they're dominating the whole space. Having said that, Basically, all the startups, the internet companies that came along in the last 10 or 20 years are on the cloud. They don't build their own data centers. They just don't anymore. Netflix was an example, but, but lots of others, you know, your, your Pinterests and your um, Intuits and, and your, you know, and so on and so forth. So those are the kinds of things that people tend to interact with most often. And in a very high proportion of those cases, probably way over 50%, you're going to one cloud, of the, one cloud or another, and AWS is the biggest of the clouds. So you know, you're going to AWS more times than anybody else. So yeah, rephrasing the question that way, I would think it highly probable that there are very few hours in the day when anybody who's using a computer isn't interacting at some level with, with AWS. That is the answer I was hoping for. <laughs> there are very few hours in the day that we may not be interacting with Amazon. And in full disclosure, I'm pretty sure 
don't actually quote me on this. I'm 90% sure that even WBUR's website is hosted on AWS. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so this, this was- If you want to find out, there's a little website oh, yeah. called isitonaws.com. Go check it out. <laughs> Type in any old, or paste in any old URL and they'll tell you. You built that website, right, Tim? The is it on AWS? Did you build that website? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do we want to do our, is it, is it time for our third, uh, our third poll? poll? Yeah, okay. let's do it. So we have one last poll question for all of you. Thank you for participating on Slido.com, hashtag on point. Um, and tell us what you think should happen to, uh, to, to on point, to Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> We're not asking that. Um, a couple options for you. If you think Amazon is too big, should it be broken up? Uh, should Regulators change antitrust rules to rein Amazon in. Should we do nothing about Amazon and its size and scope in our lives? Or if you have another opinion, feel free to choose other. And you can also send us in Slido what you think that other option should be. Oh, so many good questions coming in. OK, I promise everyone we're going to get to some of these. But um, actually, before we get to why we're polling about what we should do, we being society, about Amazon, there was a really great question here. What did you hear about work stress among headquarters, white about white collar staff at Amazon headquarters? I've heard about staff crying on the job and having to respond to 150 calls or alerts per week. Yes, I think that I learned in talking to a lot of Amazon employees um, through producing this series that there's very split opinions. To, to my takeaway is that there's a very particular kind of person who succeeds at Amazon, um, that, it, and it, that its management style really works for some people, that they, that they thrive on that kind of structure and commitment to those leadership principles, and there's clear kind of definitions of what you need to do to be successful as an Amazon employee. Um, and to others, that kind of expectation and rigidity is extraordinarily stressful. Um, and I, I talked to several Amazon corporate employees who said, you know, I did three or four years and I've never been so miserable and I had to get out. And it was, I mean, we had one voicemail who said it was ruining her life to work for Amazon. So I think people are, I, I think there is a certain kind of person who thrives, but that it can be a very intense culture. So a couple more questions from people in the audience and, and watching online. Josh, I'm going to turn this one to you because um, you've also had to deal with Amazon um, media relations a lot. There have been, over the past couple, many years, more, it's more and more focus on how Amazon treats its employees, right? So is their marketing and PR campaign working to improve their image? And being in Seattle, how would you re respond to that question? Yeah, I mean, in the same way that they reflect on the old leadership principles, um, now they reflect just as often on the newest ones, which prioritize employees, making Amazon one of the best places to work. So, um, I, I mean, they're talking about it a lot. Um, we've had several big exposés in the New York Times or in the local paper that have really stuck in their craw and made them really uncomfortable. And um, they don't feel like that press is accurate. They talk about how they feel it's inaccurate, but these stories keep coming up every few years or so. And um, I, I think they're really tired of that. And I think they've figured out that they're going to have to do something about it. Um, but it's so recent that these were added to the leadership principles and many of their corporate employees are still remote. So um, it, I'm gonna be really curious what happens when they come back to the office. This is gonna be the moment when a lot of people decide whether or not to leave Amazon and go work for Facebook or go work for Microsoft, you know, which is sometimes kind of a retirement community for Amazonians, you know, they go back and forth, so that's not totally fair, but, um, <laughs> You know, and, and that's one reason why Amazon is working so hard to keep the businesses around its corporate headquarters open, is it wants that place to be seen as lively and exciting, and there's a reason for you to come back here, so. Right, but just to underscore the point you made, Josh, of the, uh, those new leadership principles were only added this summer, right? In the tiny, like, 
half second interregnum between Jeff Bezos and Andy Jassy, right? Um, but one more uh, question from the audience here. And uh, by the way, everyone who's here with us at City Space and everyone watching online, because we had a, a little bit of that rocky start, I hope it's okay if we go over by a couple of minutes because we really do want to talk about this monopoly question too. So um, thank you for, for bearing with us, but we're getting to the meat of things here. But Tim, before we get to the monopoly question, we've got a, uh, someone here who wants to know about a little bit more about AWS. Is there a risk that Amazon Web Services could censor internet websites and content in the future? Well, there was a quite a bit of controversy when AWS kicked Parler uh, off uh, just before the election, I think that was, or no, that was around the January 6th incident, I think it was. To, and um, any, any operation these days that is, you know, hosting uh, other people's discourse and, and messaging has to worry about, uh, you know, the, the, the very severe uh, conflict that exists out there between everybody's desire to, for speech to be free and then the fact that some speech turns out to be very highly dangerous and, and lead to you know, massive amounts of illegal behavior. Um, I, I wouldn't want to be the one making those calls. And I think that you know, in terms of what we're doing on the internet, um, uh, we're still learning. We still haven't learned really how to have an, a discourse that remains reasonably open and keeps what we call the trolls somewhat uh, under control. So, so sure, it's absolutely the case that, that AWS uh, might and in fact has, you know, shut down uh, uh, voices that uh, are just ejected from AWS, uh, voices that, that they didn't want to host. But I wouldn't think it's worse there than it might be uh, you know, at Facebook or, or Google or Reddit or, or, or really anywhere else. It's a problem that the whole industry is, is grappling with. Right, and so that's why this final question, I feel like, is so vitally important about the power right, that these companies have. You saw the poll briefly about how I think most people who answered said that we should probably break it up. Is that what the... The dominant response was in the in the polls. Or regulation. I think. Regulation. Okay, regulation. Thank you for that. She fact checks me as well. Um, but so my our, our big third uh, our third and final takeaway for tonight um, is really this question of how do we come down on understanding whether or not Amazon is a monopoly, right? Or, or do we even have an accurate definition of what a monopoly is? in the 21st century economy. And let me just uh, quote Brad Stone, um, who's with Bloomberg, who's written um, a couple of really great books about Amazon and what he told us in episode eight of our series. He, says, he said, basically, Amazon sits on a pile of cash. It has the ability to attract the best of the best talent in technology and engineering. And those two things in combination allow them the freedom to invade industries. And then I, I had told him that the the way the accrual of those advantages work, it gives them exponential power um, over most other companies. And that those exponents just add on top of each other. And then Brad agreed, and he said, that's why regulators are moving with panic to slow down Amazon's growth. And Andy Jassy, the new CEO, is also trying to usher in an era that recognizes criticism of the company, underscoring that with success comes responsibility. But the energy, the political energy, I guess, around Amazon's power, Brad said, is undeniable. So, Tim, here's my question for you. Before we get you to answer whether or not Amazon is a monopoly, you actually did answer the question in the form of a six-page narrative. <laughs> so can you just briefly tell us what is the six-page narrative in Amazon? What is that thing? So in Amazon, when a major decision is to be made, obviously there's going to be a meeting. And what makes Amazon unique is no PowerPoints are allowed. Um, for anything that really matters, somebody has to write a narrative. There can be one pages, two pages, but six pages are the most common. And normally they take the form of a PR slash FAQ, which stands for press release, frequently asked questions. And in that document, whoever is proposing whatever is, what they want to have done has to write a press release for what's going to be said when you, you know, launch whatever you want to launch, and then a bunch of questions about it. And it imposes a very heavy burden on the author of that document to write a compelling linear story that anybody can understand. And I think it is a much better way to make decisions, and it's one of the reasons why Amazon has been successful. And so you wrote a six-page narrative about whether Amazon is monopoly and should it be broken up, which I love that. You use their own technique to analyze the company. How, after writing the six-page narrative, what did you conclude? 
Well, I, the, my goal was specifically that AWS should be spun out of, out of Amazon. And I don't think we have time to, to dive deeply into that, but I believe strongly that AWS should be uh, spun out of Amazon. But to answer your larger question, uh, Amazon and its big tech peers, and in fact the whole top tier of the U.S. economy, is rife with monopoly. Beer is monopolized, mattresses are monopolized, eyeglasses are monopolized, cheerleading squads are mon monopolized, uh, web search is monopolized, desktop office software is monopolized, large scale ma marketing services for things imported from China are monopolized. Um, it would really be very, very good for the health of the United States and the economy of the Western world if the, if the anti-monopoly agencies in, in, the, in the U.S. government went in there aggressively and, and broke up, not just Amazon, yes, Amazon, but also Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, um, who am I forgetting? Anyhow, um, Google, uh, and, and, and actually bring a modicum of balance of power and real good old-fashioned competition back to the U.S. economy because at the moment it is sorely lacking. Now, big tech is a place that it sticks out in particular vividness and Amazon sticks out even in that in, in that coterie but you know let's not kid ourselves that we have an Amazon problem what we have is an overly high concentration of wealth and power in the in the economy that urgently needs to be fixed and the best first steps forward is some serious corporate breakups so you're bringing the fire now Tim Bray <laughs> I love it but so we we talked to David Boies, the famed litigator. He's argued in front of the Supreme Court a lot on a variety of cases. And we talked to him because in the late 90s and early 2000s, he was seconded by the Justice Department to try a monopoly case against another Seattle-based, well, Redmond-based company specifically. See, I know my Pacific Northwest geography, guys. Um, my, the Microsoft uh, a monopoly case that the Justice Department brought of, in the late 90s. And Tim, especially, I want you to, to listen to this because here's one of the things that David Boyce told us about whether or not the federal government should be looking at Amazon in particular um, as a monopoly and face the kind of scrutiny that Microsoft was under. You can't look at a company and say, because they're big, they're a antitrust violator. You've got to look at how did they get to be big? How did they keep being big? What are they doing to prevent other people from competing with them? And those are fact specific. So even if, I, if my firm had not represented Amazon, I would be reluctant to sort of give you much of, a, uh, much of an answer to that. <laughs> that last part saying that, of course, he had done business with Amazon uh, as uh, some legal business. But, but Tim, really what, he, what um, Boyce was saying there was he actually felt that we ha our current regulation is satisfactory to deal with companies like Amazon. And if we're, gonna, if we're talking about what we should do as a society, do you, do you buy that? Or do you think we need like, new kinds of laws around these companies? I do not buy that, and I'm not even sure it's a matter of needing new kinds of laws, but interpretation of existing laws. At some point, following on you know uh, legal arguments by Robert Bork, uh, they, the antitrust apparatus of the United States government decided that the only thing that mattered was consumer harm. You know, if you couldn't demonstrate explicit consumer harm, there couldn't be an anti-monopoly or an antitrust case, so just drop it and give up. Well, I happen to think that Americans and human beings in general are not just consumers. They, you know, they're, they're, they're more than just that. And, and I think that the excessive concentration of power brings damage to uh, uh, things other than just simple consumer welfare, such as overly high concentration of, of political power and gaming regulations and what we have been hearing about, about the anomalously high injury rates in warehouses and so on. All of those things are joined at the hip to the overwhelmingly large power, not just of Amazon, but of the tech sector in general, and not just the tech sector, but you know the economy in general. So, so I, I disagree with, with, with Mr. Boys, uh, and, and I think that there is immense scope for aggressive antitrust, and, and I'm super happy that they've appointed Lena Khan to, to run that division down in Washington because do not underestimate that woman. She is incredibly sharp and very aggressive and I think has a very realistic view of, of the deep structure of the economy at, at the high level and the need for drastic reduction in the collective power of, 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 of big tech. We could not talk to Lena Khan for this series, we though we tried very hard. <laughs> um, but we did talk to Congressman David Cicilline, um, who has introduced a whole package of antitrust legislation. So I just wanted to, to mention that we 
covered kind of extensively the efforts in the U.S. House to rein in big tech companies specifically, but also to modernize our, our antitrust laws. But we talked to Michael Cusimano when we had Tim Bray on um, about breaking up Amazon and possible legislation. Uh, Cusimano is the deputy dean at the MIT Sloan School of Management and author of The Business of Platforms. And he said this about antitrust enforcement and Amazon. I would be very cautious about breaking up uh, Amazon, but I do have uh, certainly some thoughts about where they do seem to be potentially abusing their position. There's been a lot of complaints over the years uh, about uh, the Amazon store and Amazon marketplace. So okay. these are two separate businesses. We, you talked about them before, uh, using data from uh, the marketplace to inform which products or services Amazon should go into directly, or what we call self-preferencing, giving their own products uh, first listing after a search. Many people use uh, Amazon to search. So those kinds of practices do seem to be abusing its position. Well, Joshua, let me come back to you here. Again, you're, you're living in the city where these decisions are emanating from about how Amazon wants to do business. It just your thoughts on the question of uh, monopoly and how does, uh, how does the growing sort of um, hum of the possibility, and I underscore the word possibility, given how Washington works, of, of regulation on Amazon, how does that go over in Seattle? That's a good question. I mean, certainly among people who work at Amazon, there's enthusiasm for not breaking the company up. Um, and among detractors, you have enthusiasm for it. I mean, um, it's a it's a complicated question. And uh, I, mean, I mean, there are so many different parts of Amazon that it's it's um, when you've got the, it's a data-driven company, and there are always people who are left out of the data. You know, I'm just thinking, going back to the grocery store, for example, you know, you've got decisions about what to stock, and um, the, comp the customers who shop at the grocery store request something when it's not there, and they are listened to, but Amazon can decide whether or not people who aren't represented in that customer base should be reached out to. And I, I don't know, I'm kind of going off in a little bit different direction here, but um, I'm not sure really how to answer your question, I think. <laughs> That's okay, but I mean, the multiple directions that every question about Amazon goes is something that I learned about this company because every part feeds into every other part. So I, I completely hear that. I mean, we should say that about the start of the series in general. We <laughs> yeah. thought that we could break Amazon up into eight manageable pieces of hour-long conversations, and we got into each one of them and found that none of those parts were manageable, no. <laughs> um, especially AWS. Well, two last comments, and then I have one last question for both of you. And We've gone over time, so I really thank everybody for your patience here. But uh, we've got some comments coming in on the Slido where someone's, someone's saying the company needs to pay taxes, a la what you were saying earlier, Josh. Considerable regulatory oversight for mistreatment of non-corporate employees. Break it up. And this is uh, the person identifies themselves as a very early Amazon employee. And then someone else says, I love what Tim Bray is saying. There are too many monopolies. We need more corporate breakups. So many people going out of business because of monopolies. Um, so my, la my last question for both of you is, again, I am very, very uh, focused on what we as citizens need to understand about these companies, or Amazon in particular, in order to make good decisions, say, at the ballot box. So what is it, and Tim, I'll start with you. I mean, what's the one most important thing that you think we should understand about Amazon when we think about who we want to elect or what policies we want to support that uh, people don't know enough about? I think Amazon is an example of a company that does a very good job of playing by the rules most of the time anyhow and skating right up to the edge of the line and maybe over it here and there but by and large they are a company that plays by the rules and that means that as a society if we do not like what we observe amazon to be doing well we need to change the rules and yelling at amazon 
isn't going to help do that. It's a job for old-fashioned politics. Find out, find you know, candidates who share what is becoming an increasingly popular view of the uh, unacceptability of the huge power and wealth imbalance, and are bringing practical ideas forward how to address that. Now, we don't need to change. We don't really need to invent new policies. There are existing well-known policies in the areas of antitrust and labor regulation, and so on and so forth. That, in fact, are being applied somewhat successfully in other parts of the world, notably Europe. Um, so, so it doesn't require cr crazy, radical ideas. It just requires a somewhat more progressive brand of politics with particular attention, as, as I think you know, I've emphasized several times now, to antitrust. Um, and you know, when you've got a company that's doing something badly, you can regulate it and they will try and capture the regulation and escape the regulation. Or you can break it up into multiple companies and then let, the, let them compete against each other and have the free market work on your own side. I prefer the latter approach. But you know, this is a, a reasonable debate we should be having as a society. Yeah, well, I'm point well taken. There's First of all, there's no such thing as a perfectly pure free market. And as in a democratic society, we have the right to make the rules of those markets. I think oftentimes of those markets, and oftentimes we forget that. We have that right as a society. Uh, and Josh, from your experience reporting on Amazon for so long, from seeing how, you know, what kind of a corporate neighbor it is in Seattle, would love to know what you think the rest of us away from Seattle should understand about the company that we may not already. I feel like the city that Amazon is helping build in Seattle tells us a lot about the kind of country that we're building right now in terms of um, who benefits from this economy and who's left out. And I think we can, I think we can take some lessons as to whether that's the kind of country we want to build by observing what's happening here with the distribution of wealth concentrated in a handful of tech companies. Um, I don't know, there's some really great things that come out of Amazon and its technology and its innovation. Its people are problem solvers to the core. And many of them are very active on, you know, in civic groups trying to make the world a better place. Um, this is a little bit though, you know, the sort of Carnegie model where we look for the, you know, wealthiest members of our society to just sort of swoop in and, and help fund the underfunded homeless shelter, you know, as Amazon has done, it's built a homeless shelter in its headquarters, you know, um, but do we want our government to rely on that kind of largesse when it chooses to show its face, you know? Wow. Well, you can see why, even though it practically killed Dory to do this series, I felt that eight hours was not enough. Um, but I just want to say uh, to you, Joshua McNichols, Thank you so much. Joshua is the reporter and host of the podcast Primed. It's all about Amazon. He's at KUOW, a terrific public radio station. We're so happy to talk with you, Joshua. Thank you so very much. I'm going to. Thank and you. Thank you. Sure all, of our virtual, all of our virtual participants are clapping for you, too, Josh. <laughs> and Tim Bray, um, now at Textuality Services, former vice president and distinguished engineer at AWS. Tim. Such profound insight. Thank you so very much for being with us. Um, and I really want to sincerely thank Dory Scheimer, our senior editor, who was the force behind this whole series and gave, worked her fingers to the bone uh, <clears throat> to break through that Amazon wall uh, so we could do this series. Um, everyone at City Space tonight, it's been a fun real-time debugging exercise, and you did brilliantly, so thank you so very much. Um, I also want to shamelessly plug, again, Josh's podcast, Primed, shamelessly plug our podcast, um, the On Point podcast, to so subscribe to both if you haven't already, because here's why. Again, we need tools as citizens. We need insights. We need knowledge that we can rely on to make the kinds of decisions, to set the kinds of rules that Tim was talking about. And I will always, till my dying day, believe that public broadcasting is a place to get that kind of knowledge as citizens. So subscribe, OK, <laughs> if you haven't already. Um, and thank you to everyone for coming here to City Space uh, at the WBR studios tonight. And thank you for everyone who watched online. Um, that our success depends on your participation with us in this civic, civic endeavor. And we always want to hear your ideas. 
always. So go to um, onpointradio.org. You can find all ways to, to contact us, send us your ideas. And for the full lineup of future city space events, go to wbur.org slash events. There'll be a lot more good stuff coming up as, as city space um, fully charges into this new world of hybrid events. So thank you everyone so much tonight. It was really a pleasure. Thank you. And good night and good afternoon, <laughs> Seattle. Bye.